Planning a trip to Grand Teton National Park can feel a little overwhelming. There are so many great activities, so many beautiful views in this park. And so today, let's plan together so that we can make sure that you get to all the best stuff and have a fantastic vacation. My name is Ash, I'm a former park ranger. I actually worked as a park ranger in Grand Teton National Park. I've also visited this park almost yearly for my entire life. And so I know the park backwards and forwards. I have been here so many times. I have explored basically every nook and cranny. And so I am really excited to be here with you today to talk you through your trip planning so that you can have a fantastic trip to Grand Teton National Park. So let's jump in. I have so much to share with you today and I can't wait. Grand Teton National Park is located in Wyoming. It's actually just barely south of Yellowstone. So you're talking the top northwestern corner of Wyoming. Uh, and like I said, Yellowstone is super close by. So a lot of people like to visit both parks during their vacation. Today we'll focus on Grand Teton, but I do have videos for Yellowstone as well if you plan on going to both parks. Grand Teton is famous for its massive mountain peaks. There are so many beautiful views, so many good hiking trails in this park. And these mountains just seemingly pop out of nowhere, making for just some fantastic experiences. And so uh, if you have never been to a mountain landscape, this is a really great place to start because there are some fantastic hiking opportunities no matter your ability but you will want to really get into these mountains and explore them because I think they're one of the best mountain ranges in the country. So the highest elevation that you can reach by road in Grand Teton National Park is the Signal Mountain Summit Road that takes you to about 7,700 feet above sea level. So you are at a pretty good elevation here. Uh, a lot of this park is flat when you're down in the valleys um, doing some hiking. A lot of it stays pretty flat. When you start heading up into the canyons, that's when you'll start really gaining that elevation. Grand Teton, the peak itself, is almost 14,000 feet above sea level. So again, if you're not used to a mountain landscape, then you will want to make sure that you're acclimatizing to that altitude, uh, that you're taking it easy for the first day or so. Uh, because you are at a pretty good elevation here. What I think is interesting is that this park is about 310,000 acres. Uh, in comparison to that, Yellowstone is 2.2 million. And so Grand Teton is much smaller than Yellowstone. Um, Yellowstone is very complex. You can spend hours driving between each point of interest. Uh, in Grand Teton, that's just not so. It's a much smaller park. Uh, it's easier to get to places, uh, things are a lot more centralized and so that makes it easier to plan out your lodging and to, uh, you know, make sure that you're not just spending a ton of time in your car. Um, so that's really nice. What becomes difficult with Grand Teton is that it is consistently in the top 10 most visited national parks in the country. And so there are a lot of people packing into this smaller area, uh, a lot of overflow from people who visit Yellowstone and then decide to come down to Grand Teton as well. And so you will encounter some very crowded areas. Uh, it can be really difficult to get camping and lodging reservations. Uh, and you will be stuck in crowds if you don't have a good plan. So I'm glad you're here today. We can talk you through kind of the best way to plan, but I also have an itinerary on Dirt in My Shoes that will make sure that you're able to get around this park without dealing with all of those crowding issues. So um, let's move forward. Let's talk about the best way to get to Grand Teton, including uh, where to fly into. Okay, so looking at the park map, let me just show you. So they have this nice regional map here. So this is the top corner of Wyoming. We've got Idaho over here and Montana up here. This giant square here is Yellowstone. And then this little square down here is Grand Teton. 
And so again, Grand Teton is much smaller. These two parks are only separated by eight miles of road. You can see a bigger version of that here. So you've got Yellowstone, you've got the south entrance of Yellowstone right here. You've got this John D. Rockefeller Memorial Parkway, which is eight miles, and then you cross into Grand Teton here, and then you've got Grand Teton down here. When we're talking about getting to Grand Teton, uh, there is actually an airport within the national park itself, which is very unique. Uh, so you can fly into Jackson Hole, the Jackson Hole Airport, and that will put you right inside of Grand Teton. Um, the views coming into that airport, as you can probably imagine, are astounding. Uh, but that airport is smaller, it is a little more expensive, so a lot of people don't actually fly in there for their vacation. Uh, a lot of people fly into Salt Lake City. It's about four hours or so to drive up from Salt Lake City. Um, it, that works. A lot of people do that. Um, a lot of people will do that for both Grand Teton and Yellowstone. Another airport that's a large international airport in the area is Bozeman. Um, that puts you north of Yellowstone. So again, uh, you know, a lot of times you'll want to hit both parks. It would make sense to fly into Bozeman if you're also going to Yellowstone. Uh, if you're not, you probably want to fly into Salt Lake City. Uh, and then again, if you can swing the price tag, uh, the Jackson Hole Airport is really great. You've also got some smaller airports. There's one in Idaho Falls. There is one in West Yellowstone. There's one out here in Cody. Here's the Jackson Hole Airport is actually just right in there. And so, you know, you do have some options here. As you can see, you can see Bozeman right up here. Salt Lake City is down in here. And so any of those options will work. What's nice is you do have a lot of bigger population areas pretty close to this park. You've got some main freeways coming through here that will get you pretty close. And so driving to Grand Teton really isn't that much of a hassle. You'll be on good roads for most of the time. You know, you start getting into some smaller roads as you get closer to the park, but a lot of your driving will be along interstates. And so it just makes it really nice. And then, like I said, you can visit both parks really easily. Now, where it gets a little tricky is timing of uh, the best time to be in Grand Teton because for a big mountain park like this, uh, you're very dependent on Mother Nature. Uh, there can often be snow well into the summer. And so uh, your timing does matter here in this park. It doesn't matter as much when you go to Yellowstone. Um, Yellowstone, we can work around a little easier. With Grand Teton, if you're hoping to hike back into the canyons, uh, if you're hoping to really dig deep into this park, uh, then you will want to pay attention to when you plan your trip. Um, so let's talk about some great options for that. Okay, so word of warning, um, I typically like to avoid the spring months in this park, as well as like the late fall, early winter months. Uh, those are very limited in what you can do. The roads are still closed, but you can't do winter activities or summer activities. And so it's kind of this weird limbo time. So I do typically try to avoid um, pretty much the month of April and a little bit into May and then um, late October and into November. Those are the times of year that I would just avoid, especially as a first time visitor. Um, if you're wanting winter activities, then the winter here is actually fantastic. They actually groom some of their roads for cross-country skiing. There's some great places to go cross-country skiing in this park. And then there's also a lot of ski resorts kind of outside down towards Jackson and over into Idaho. And so there is a lot to do here during the winter. But if you're wanting that quintessential, like I'd, I've never been to the Tetons and I really want to experience them, then you will want to plan your trip during the summer months. Planning a trip in, I would say I wouldn't go really any earlier than like mid-May if you can help it. Um, and But mid-May into June, you still will probably encounter snow on the trails, um, even the valley trails, which I'll show you here in a minute on the map but uh, you do still hit some snow in this park um, going into June. Usually around June, the valley trails and the valley areas will have thawed out and melted out 
but you will still have a ton of snow up in the canyons. And so if you're wanting to do any backpacking or any longer trails, then I would plan your trip for later in the summer, probably no earlier than about mid-July. You can still encounter snow back there in the backcountry well into July and even into August. Um, there's been plenty of years where I've been back there hiking and still couldn't get past certain areas of trails um, because they just weren't safe due to snow. And um, most recently, that was in late July. So <laughs> um, the snow really does play a big factor here. If you're wanting to do a lot of bigger hiking trails, then I would probably aim for early August. Uh, but if you don't care to do a lot of these longer trails, if you're wanting to stick to some of the um, shorter and easier trails in this park, then you can go as early as mid-May and still be able to do a lot. So it really depends more on what you're hoping to do while you're in the Tetons. Um, I really love September in this park. It is beautiful. You may encounter snow. It's not unheard of to have snowstorms coming through in September. Um, usually they don't linger. Usually they will melt out, but it does happen. So, <laughs> um, but September is lovely. You get, you get really beautiful fall colors in this park. You've got elk that are just bugling everywhere. It is one of my favorite times to be here. So coming later, like once you start getting into October, that's when the weather again, just starts to get a little iffy. I have been there in early October and it's been absolutely fantastic. Um, I've also been there in September and it snowed, you know, six inches. So <laughs> uh, when you start getting into the fall, that it gets a little bit more iffy with the weather. But uh, there is a pretty good season here. Typically from about mid-May through September, you can access a lot of this park. So I want to show you on the map kind of what I'm talking about here as far as valley versus mountains. And this isn't a great map for this, but I'll kind of hopefully explain it well. All of this down in here, so all of these roads and everything, these are all in the valley area of Grand Teton. So Grand Teton is very flat <laughs> through here, really, really flat all through here. And then the mountains just kind of shoot up right here so so it's nice there's not really like foothills and stuff down in here it pretty much goes from flat to mountain and so anything really along these roads here any trails you're wanting to hike or things you're wanting to do this is the area that will melt out pretty early in the summer so you'll be able to do a lot of stuff here so some of the most popular things got like Mormon Row and the Molten Barn out here. If you want to hike to Taggart Lake even, this is still pretty much down in the valley. So you can get there usually pretty early in the season. If you're wanting to take the shuttle boat across Jenny Lake, you've got Hidden Falls over here. That opens up pretty early in the season as well. You've got a bunch of trails around here, around Lee Lake and String Lake and Jenny Lake. So again, a lot of really good options down here. If you go north, you've got some great viewpoints out along here. You've got some good hiking right in here. And so there are a lot of options in the flat valley area that does thaw out a lot earlier. Where the struggle comes in is if you're hoping to get back into the mountains. So like I said, this isn't a great map for this, but I can walk you through it as best as I can. But if you're wanting to go up like into Cascade Canyon, which leaves from the other side of Jenny Lake, then you are hiking up this direction. Once you start leaving these lakes here, that's when you're hitting those higher mountain trails. So you've got canyons going up here, you've got Paintbrush Canyon going up here, you've got Death Canyon going up here by Phelps Lake. So any of these trails that are going in like this, those are canyon trails that will be harder to access earlier in the summer. And then as you get back into here, so there's trails that go all along the Teton Range back in here, the Teton Crest Trail, you've got some good loop trails, some fork trails, all of those are going to be the ones that you're going to want to come later in the summer if you're hoping to hike that. So that would include like uh, Lake Solitude. I mentioned the Teton Crest Trail. If you're wanting to get into like onto the Death Canyon shelf, 
the Alaska Basin, any of those longer trails, you will have a harder time getting back there until about mid-July if it's a bad snow year, but into August if it's a normal year. Now regarding updates to this park, so I am not talking specifics in this video of what it is like in the park right now. Um, you will want to check the National Park Service website for Grand Teton and make sure that you're checking those current conditions because uh, it will change and fluctuate and uh, I'm not going to include that information here. So click over to nps.gov grte and you can find the updates there. Um, if you're wanting help navigating specifically what it is like in the park when you're going, um, then that's what my Grand Teton itinerary on Dirt in My Shoes will do. I keep up on all of that stuff. I walk you through, you know, what changes you need to make to your schedule to account for construction closures or uh, weather closures, things like that. I will make sure that you're up to date on that, but um, that's included in my itinerary and I'm not going to go into that in this video. Let's talk for a minute about how many days to spend in this park because typically I encourage you to spend about four days if you can in Yellowstone. Grand Teton is a lot smaller than Yellowstone and so you can cut that time in half. Two full days is pretty good for this park. Three if you can swing it um, and then you can hike a couple of longer trails in that amount of time, but if you're wanting to really get back into those longer trails, then you'll want to give yourself some extra time. But I recommend three full days if you can do it. Two is fine. Um, you can get to a lot in two days. Some people just like to visit for one and that's fine. You can see a lot in one day. Um, you can drive the park roads. You can get just all those gorgeous views. Um, if you're only staying for one day, then you wouldn't have as much time, obviously, to get on some of the best hiking trails in the park and to really explore. But one day in the park is fine. You can see a lot there. I encourage three days. I think people shortchange Grand Teton. Most people are more excited to visit Yellowstone. It's better known. You know, it's more unique. And so people tend to focus more on Yellowstone and kind of treat Grand Teton as an afterthought which I think is a mistake. Grand Teton is definitely worth any time you can give it. So if you can do four full days in Yellowstone and three full days in Grand Teton, that is the perfect trip. Okay, so now I wanna talk about lodging and luckily for this park, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it doesn't get too complex here. And so uh, let's take a look at the map and I'll walk you through where I would stay or uh, what your options are and hopefully that will help me help you make a great decision. Okay, so we're at the map again, and basically what you have, so it doesn't show it on this map, but you've got the town of Jackson just right down here. So it's a very quick drive into Grand Teton from Jackson. It takes about 20 minutes or so to get up here to Moose and to the visitor center here. A lot of people like to stay in Jackson. It's a really fun town. There are tons of lodging options lots of good restaurants, um, souvenir shops, they have a nightly shootout, they, it's, they do it well. It's one of my favorite national park towns. So if you want to stay right there in Jackson, that works great. Uh, you won't be too far from the park and then you'll still have all the amenities of town. Looking at the map again, coming over here, you've got Teton Village, you've got Wilson down here. Those are both really great options as well. It's really easy to get to the park from here. You can take the Moose Wilson Road into the Moose area here. The Moose Wilson Road is partially dirt. It's, it's a fine road. You have to be 23 feet or less to drive this road. And it is pretty slow going. It's narrow. It's fantastic. There's lots of beautiful views along this road, but it's not as quick as it looks on the map. So just keep that in mind, but you can easily get up to, into the park from there or you can drive around to Jackson and go up this way. So as far as towns go, I would choose between one of those three if you can. Uh, it does get a little bit expensive to stay in these resort towns, and so a lot of people do tend to look for options a little further out, um, which is fine. You're typically driving through a canyon if you're staying, um, say, if you go into like the Alpine area or Victor. A lot of people like to go into Victor. 
Um, that's a big canyon drive as you're coming into Jackson Hole and the Grand Teton area. So um, do keep that in mind. If you can be right in the Jackson area, that would be preferable. Now coming up, so you enter the park here and you've got over here, you've got the Grovant Campground. And this is a really large campground. It's really great for RVs and trailers. It's quite close to the town of Jackson. So you're just here kind of skirting the southern edge of the park. That's a great option. Basically anything within the park, kind of between Coulter Bay to Grovant, this whole area here is fantastic for your lodging options. You can get to all the areas of the park easily from any of these places. And so it really just depends. Are you wanting to camp? You've got Grovant here. You've got Jenny Lake Campground. You've got Signal Mountain Campground. You've got a Coulter Bay Campground. All of those work well. If you're wanting to stay in a lodge, you've got Coulter Bay, Jackson Lake, Signal Mountain, Jenny Lake. So again, a lot of really good options here. If you're hoping to camp, I do have a full video on camping in Grand Teton where, where I'll talk you through um, your options and kind of how to set up your lodging with camping. If you're staying in a lodge, any of the park lodges will do. They're all quite central. And so again, you can stay either in a lodge in the park or head down to Jackson, Wilson, or Teton Village, and you'll be easily within striking distance of all the best things to do in this park. I get a lot of questions about coming up this direction. So when you get into the northern area of the park, that's where it gets a little more challenging to be close to everything that you'll want to do in Grand Teton. So there is a campground here in Lizard Creek. You've also got a campground up here at Flag Ranch as well as a lodge and some cabins. And so a lot of people ask me about staying in these areas. On the surface, it seems to make sense to want to stay um, in one central place, especially if you're going to Grand Teton and Yellowstone. A lot of people look at Flag Ranch and say, oh, that's perfect. That's right in between the two parks. I would actually encourage you to book two separate lodging options, one for Grand Teton and one for Yellowstone. Being in the middle of the two parks and, and staying at Flag Ranch will just make for tons of driving on every day. <laughs> so getting up into Yellowstone, even though you're pretty close to the south entrance of Yellowstone, you're not that close to the main things that you're going to want to do in that park. And vice versa, even though you're pretty close to Grand Teton, staying at the Flag Ranch or one of those northern areas, you're just not that close to actually where most of the activities and most of the things you'll want to do are. So I do recommend planning your lodging separate uh, book something specifically for Grand Teton and then book something specifically for Yellowstone if you're hoping to really cut down on your drive time and to not cut into your sightseeing time. So again, looking at the map, can you stay up here? Yeah, you can, but most of what you're going to want to do in Grand Teton is down in this area. It's not a huge deal for Grand Teton because you're adding maybe a half an hour or so extra drive time if you're coming from up here, where it becomes a bigger problem, I think, is with Yellowstone because you're driving up into Yellowstone and then you've got, if you look at the smaller map, you've got this whole stretch of road before you even really hit anything of note in Yellowstone. And even still, you're still quite far away from some of the main areas. So I don't like to book one place for both parks and I suggest that if you can, to book something specifically for Grand Teton while you're there. This whole area is just chock full of things that you can do. Uh, regardless of what you like to do, you can find an activity for you. So I do have a full video on the 12 things that I would not miss in Grand Teton, and that will walk you through all the things that you'll wanna plan on hitting on your first trip to this park. Uh, but let's take a look at the map again and I'll kind of talk you through some of the best things you can do in Grand Teton. Okay, so you can see that Grand Teton has basically two main roads. You've got this road, also known as the Outer Park Road. It's Highway 89, but this road, it's fast. <laughs> the speed limits are high. You can travel along this road pretty fast. 
and there's not a lot of hiking along this road. This road is primarily viewpoints. So what you've got, you've got a beautiful molten barn, which is out here on Mormon Row. You've got all sorts of viewpoints along this way. One of my favorites is Schwabacher's Landing, which is down in here. It takes you right down next to the river with fantastic mountain views. You've got the Snake River Overlook up in here. This is where Ansel Adams took that famous photo of the Tetons, and it is just gorgeous. And then once you get up into here, so this is the Moran Junction here. If you turn left, then you'll go through the Moran entrance, and then you'll be basically in the northern area of the park here, which has Oxbow Bend, which is a, just a fantastic viewpoint as well. And then you get up into the Jackson Lake Lodge and Coulter Bay areas. Jackson Lake Lodge and Coulter Bay are um, more wildlife heavy, I would say, if you're looking for some big animals. Um, this is typically where we have the best luck seeing bears. Uh, you will see moose up here. You'll see elk up here. Not that you won't see them other places either, but I do feel like the northern part of the park is typically uh, the best place or where I've had a lot of luck seeing a lot of wildlife. And so that's really fun. Um, you can go to the Jackson Lake Lodge and look out over Willow Flats and there's just almost always wildlife down in there. So I got chased by a moose uh, <laughs> in my car driving along Willow Flats. The big bull moose came out and like started chasing the car. So that's really exciting and scary. Um, but there are a lot of moose and elk and things like that up there in Willow Flats. So that's a really good area. And then as you get north of Coulter Bay up here towards Lizard Creek and Headwaters or Flag Ranch, that's when there's a lot less to do. There's not as many hikes. There's not as many pullouts. The mountains over on this side of Jackson Lake just don't have very many trails and the roads don't go out there and it's hard to get over there. And so beyond that, you know, you really don't have much to do up here. It's gorgeous but your activities are limited. So coming back down, then you have this inner park road. This is the Teton Park Road. And this is the one that takes you up pretty close to the mountains. You will see a lot of viewpoints out here that will put the mountains in your face <laughs> along this road. And so uh, it's a great place to go if you're wanting to get some closer up mountain views without having to hike. Uh, a lot of activities do start along this road as well. And so you've got the main visitor center for the park down here is this Craig Thomas Discovery Visitor Center. You come up here, you've got trails to Taggart Lake and Bradley Lake. You can hike even further into the mountains over here and get up to Surprise and Amphitheater Lake. And then you get to the Jenny Lake area, which is the busiest and most popular area of the park. So from Jenny Lake, you've got a visitor center, a campground, you've got a shuttle boat that takes you across Jenny Lake, and then you can hike up to Hidden Falls and Inspiration Point, which are both just beautiful, beautiful areas in these mountains. I like to go beyond Inspiration Point and head into Cascade Canyon, which is where you'll just get giant mountain views. So that's really great. There's often a lot of moose up in that canyon as well. If you keep going further north, that's when you'll get to String Lake, which is one of my favorite lakes to swim or paddle in. And so that's a really good option. You can hike up here to Lee Lake. This little thing right here is String Lake. It's pretty small, but it's great for swimming. And so we like to spend a lot of time there as well. Most of the canyon trails, if you're hoping to get back into the mountains, We'll start along this stretch here. So you'll find your parking areas here and then you'll make your way on various trails up into the mountains. So this area stays really busy. It's absolutely beautiful. You're really close to a lot of great activities. So this, I would say, is the most central part of the park if you're wanting to be close to everything. The Jenny Lake Campground stays really busy and there is a lodge there as well. If you head a little further north, then you'll find the Signal Mountain area right here on Jackson Lake. You can rent canoes here. You can do horseback riding. They've got a bunch of stuff you can do. There's not as much hiking right there at Signal Mountain, but again, you're only within minutes of some of the best trails in the park. 
The last area I want to mention, which I did mention a little bit before, is the Moose Wilson Road. This road, you can visit the Lawrence Rockefeller Preserve, which is really cool, and you can also hike up to Phelps Lake from here. There are several other canyon hikes that you can do up here. So you can go up Open Canyon or Granite Canyon to get back into the backcountry back here. And so there are some options, some good hiking options along this road, but you do need to be in a vehicle that's less than 23 feet and some of it is dirt road. So just keep that in mind. But this road leads you right into Moose where you can then catch the Teton Park Road to get up to those main activity areas. One of my favorite things to do in Grand Teton or when I'm in the area is to go rafting. Um, you've got the Snake River that just cuts right through this park and down near the town of Jackson and it just, oh, it's so much fun. So if you're wanting to do some whitewater rafting on your trip to Wyoming, I suggest doing it near Grand Teton. You can do whitewater rafting from the town of Jackson. That's where all of those outfitters are that will take you down into the canyon. Um, if you're wanting to do a scenic float trip, then I recommend booking a float trip through one of the companies that operates up in the national park itself because um, that scenery just can't be beat. <laughs> Can you imagine floating down the Snake River with Teton views all around you and lots of wildlife? It just doesn't get better than that. So um, if you're doing a scenic float, then I would book something that operates in the national park um, if you're doing whitewater, then you'll want to go into the town of Jackson and book through one of those companies. So a typical day in Grand Teton National Park for me looks like a nice early morning. If you're trying to get really beautiful photos of the Teton Range, you'll want to be out in the morning. Sunrise in this park is just phenomenal because the light hits the mountains so well. Uh, some of my favorite photos I've ever taken in this park were around sunrise or during those morning hours. So that does make a difference if you're hoping to get some really nice photos of the mountains. Um, I like to be out early as well because it's just nice to hit the trails, especially if you're trying to do something longer um, to get out there and to get going before it gets too busy and before the parking lots get full. So um, because this park is a little bit smaller, the parking lots are a little bit smaller as well. You don't have just like big, massive parking lots in this park. And so it does make it really nice to get out and get going so that you can find parking and hit the trail before everybody else. And I mentioned before, you know, a lot of the traffic and crowding that you'll encounter will be kind of in this area here mostly because you've got all those big trailheads that lead up into the canyons. You've got some great lake hikes right along here. And so if you're heading out for the day, if you can get out there early, you can get parking in those places and then you won't have a problem later fighting against the crowds to get in there. If you're heading more out towards this way and kind of up here to the northern part, then it's not as critical that you're out early or anything. You can still find parking pretty much everywhere along here at almost any time of the day. It really hasn't reached that point where it's just like you can't get parking anywhere in the middle of the day. And so that makes it really nice. Um, if you're looking for less crowds, then the northern part of the park does stay a lot quieter. I really like the feel up there because it just feels a little more wild and you're not as packed in um, with all the people. But again, uh, if you're hoping to get to all those main areas, then get out there early and get in there so that you can get some parking. The other nice thing that as you're out exploring Grand Teton, you'll notice that there are a lot of amenities in this park. You're never going to be too far from the restrooms or uh, restaurants. You'll have drinking water pretty close by. Like there's places that you can stop along the way, usually within 10 to 15 minutes of anywhere um, where you can get those amenities. So that's really nice as well because uh, it's not like you have to pack up everything that you need for the day and then head into the park. Uh, you really can break it up nicely with uh, places that you can relax, places you can shop. There's lots of gift shops and, and visitor centers as you go through the park. 
and um, lots of places to eat so you don't necessarily have to bring in your own food. Uh, it just makes it really nice. You have a lot of options. You can vacation however you like to in this park. If you can swing it, I would definitely try to be in Grand Teton for the sunset at some point as well. Um, for getting photos of the mountains with the light on them, I prefer sunrise, but sunsets behind the mountain range are just fantastic as well. So if you can swing a sunset as well as stargazing, uh, some of the best night skies can be found in this park. It is so dark and clear, and um, I really love joining the, the campground ranger programs in the evenings. Sometimes they do have star watching ones, uh, but they're always good. And so if you can spend an evening in Grand Teton uh, at least once during your trip, you won't be sorry. It's absolutely gorgeous at that time of the day. Just a couple more things I wanna mention. A lot of people don't realize how cold it gets in this park in the evenings. <laughs> and so uh, it will be really nice and comfortable during a summer day. Um, usually it's warm enough that you wanna jump in a lake and have some fun. So it does get pretty nice and warm, especially in those valley areas of the park. Uh, but when the sun goes down, it gets cold. Um, so if you're camping, even in the middle of the summer, or if you're hoping to do some stargazing, you'll definitely want to bring layers. Um, make sure that you have something nice and warm for those evening and nighttime hours, because uh, here up at this elevation, once that sun goes down, the temperature drops quite a bit. If at any point while you're planning your trip to Grand Teton, you just feel like you need a little bit more information, head on over to Dirt in My Shoes. I have a huge collection of articles that you can read that go even deeper into what I have talked about today. You can get way more information than what I could even touch on in this video. And so if you feel like there's questions that you still have or there's things that you still want to know, then be sure to head over to Dirt in My Shoes and check out the resources I have on Grand Teton. If at any point in this trip planning process, it just feels like too much, or you just want me to tell you when I would be where and what I would do, uh, then you can pick up a Dirt in My Shoes itinerary for Grand Teton. Uh, this is based on just my extensive experience in the park, uh, when the parking lots fill, what areas are the most crowded and when you'll wanna avoid those areas. Uh, things like that. I'll also keep you updated on any construction closures or weather closures and provide alternative options for that. So if you want just a completely done trip plan, then this itinerary will work really well for you. You'll find lots of good information here. I've got a one, two, and three day option. You'll get extra help. I have additional information on traveling through the park in an RV. And so there is a lot of stuff here. I do go in deeper to camping and lodging recommendations and how to make your schedule work for your specific group. And so you'll see, I do have an itinerary here. There's just a lot of information here. I walk you through maps driving directions, everything that you would need. And so it's all here. And so if you at any point need additional help, I am here to help you every step of the way so that you can have a fantastic trip to Grand Teton. I hope that I covered everything you had questions about. If not, leave a comment and I will be sure to get to those. I have many more Grand Teton videos that will help you, including a tips video, uh, things to do, camping, all of that is here on YouTube as well. So be sure to subscribe and check out the other Grand Teton videos that you'll need for your trip. I hope you have a fantastic time and definitely be sure to get some dirt in your shoes in this park.